Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about a hipster topic <laughs> again this year. He was with us the, on the last HIPON, but with a different topic. So this one might be interesting. I don't know, have you used ever, ever, ever used the graph database, but he'll tell you why not to use it, apparently. <laughs> Am I right? So, uh, so welcome, Yorit, to the stage, please. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to say sorry for the quick bait title. Um, yeah, I haven't been able to visit any conferences for three years, and you start watching YouTube videos, and yeah, that's what happens. Um, also, um, yeah, I'm from Holland, so I'm not wearing any shoes because I couldn't bring my uh, wooden shoes on the plane, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, welcome um, to my talk, Never Use a Graph Database, unless, except when you should. Yeah, I told you it was a clickbait title. Um, so where I'm going to talk about today is, um, of course, why you should never use a graph database. Uh, before I can explain that to you, I should, of course, tell you what a graph database actually is, um, what the strengths and weaknesses are, um, so I can, of course, tell you, okay, you should never use this, actually. Um, so let's get started with that. Uh, first, who am I? Well, you've already introduced me. I'm Jorrit van der Ven. Um, I live in the Netherlands, um, near, near Rotterdam, which is over there. Um, and I work at a company called JDriven, and JDriven is a software consultancy company uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and they're awesome because, yeah, well, they're paying me to he be here, so thank you very much for that. Um, and for the last four years, I've been doing an assignment at Port of Rotterdam, and one of that assignments was Root Scanner. And that was actually the first time in my career that I encountered a graph database. Um, so, yeah, Root Scanner is a multimodal uh, container planner. So um, if you happen to want to ship anything to anywhere, you can use, use this tool to find a route for that and then request a quote for it. And when we started with this four years ago, a data scientist came up with um, a, a prototype with Neo4j. And uh, while working with that, it was actually a good fit for our purpose. But people constantly ask me, okay, you have experience with graph databases. I have this problem. Would it fit for my problem? And most of the time, the answer was no, definitely not. Um, so that inspired me to create this talk to tell you, okay, um, most of the time you might think it's a good fit, but it's not. Um, and sometimes, okay, maybe you want to use it. So um, if you, like me, don't know what a graph database is and you want to start with that, uh, of course, what all developers do is just type it into Google, right? And um, if you do that, you will find out on Wikipedia, well, this definition, I'm not going to read it for you, but the most important thing about here is uh, this is nodes, edges, and properties. So um, basically, a graph looks something like this. Um, if you Google graph on Google Images, you will find something like this. I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> so if you came here for charts, then, well, you can still leave the room, and maybe there's a talk about Grafana or Excel, maybe. Um, so, there are actually two kinds of graph databases. Um, there's uh, triple stores and there's labeled property graphs. Uh, if you ever worked with something with the semantic web, uh, you came across triple stores and RDF. Um, and they tend to be a bit academic and, uh, well, hard to use. So, for example, if you want to store one thing in a triple database, you have to um, create both a subject, a predicate, and an object. So, for example, um, the sky is blue. Um, labeled property graphs, which is mostly where I'm going to talk about today, um, are a lot simpler, tend to be a lot faster, and well, a bit le less academic, so it gives you less he headaches. Um, and the model in there is just a lot easier. So, yeah, the definition sets uh, nodes and edges. Um, well, if you look at the data model, then everything is stored this way. So um, if you would store something in a relational database, like everything is a row, then here everything is a node. So in this case, if I want to store an actor, then I create a node with uh, the information about that actor in that. Um, a node can have a multiple of zero or more labels. So uh, in this case, Keanu Reeves is birthed both a person and an actor. Um, and you can add properties to that. So it, Keanu Reeves actually a property with name. And you can also have, of course, the birth date, for example. Um, then uh, there are, between those nodes, you can create uh, relationships called edges. 
And edges always have a type. So in this case, uh, Keanu Reeves acted in the matrix. Um, and they're always node to node. So you can't have relations between other relations. Um, you always create them unidirectional. So um, in this case, Keanu Reeves acted in the matrix, uh, which doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't query them the other way around, because you can, but you always define them in one way. Um, and of course, um, these edges can also have different properties. So for example, acted in uh, could have a property named uh, with a role. Um, yeah, so what's good to mention is that those properties are tied to the node and not to the label. So uh, graph database is schemaless. So um, if I add a label person to a node, it doesn't say that um, all those nodes of that type must have the same properties. Because it doesn't. Of course, in the normal database, uh, that's the, the, the fact. Is if you have a schema with a table with multiple columns, all the ent entries in those tables have the same columns. So to illustrate that a bit, um, let's say we want to create an internet movie database. And if we would use a, a regular relational database, the schema would look something like this. So um, we would have a table person and a table movie. And to create relations between those tables, we need to create some additional tables with constraints between them. But yeah, those are constraints. They're not relations. It only makes sure that if I add something to an actor table, with a movie ID, and that movie must exist in the movie uh, table. But it's not really a clear relation. Well, if I would store this in a graph database, then the uh, schema or meta model, what's it called in the graph database, would something like the picture on the left. So um, I would have a node with a label person, and that can have multiple relations, or has multiple relations with a node of label movie. Um, and the data that's stored in there would look something like the picture on the right. So it's all um, circles with uh, lines between them. So yeah, there are some clear differences. Um, so a relational database is really focused on the data in those uh, columns, while property graphs are also re really focused on the relationships between the data. Um, also, a relational database is fixed. So for example, if I really like uh, Keanu Reeves and I want to add a specific property to, your con to Keanu Reeves with the awesomeness factor, I can do that in a uh, graph, but I can't do that in a database. Then I have to create an additional column and suddenly all the actors have that uh, property. Um, yeah, where on the other hand, the uh, graph database is schemaless. Um, a relational database, then again, it has pretty good read and write performance because, well, they're mature. They exist for 40, 50 years now. Um, where graph databases, while well, they do exist for quite a while, uh, tend to be really read optimized. So, uh, for example, last week I had to put a data set in a graph database and it was like a million rows, and it took me half an hour to put that in, while a relational database probably less than a second. Um, does everybody know what asset compliance means? Is there anyone here who doesn't know what that means? Ah, okay, so basically it means, um, that if you store something in a transaction, uh, then it makes sure that it uh, will either be in your database or not. And for example, if the power goes out, then you won't end up with corrupted data. Um, well, both of those kinds of databases uh, are compliant with that, though uh, graph databases, you should really focus on not creating too big uh, transactions, is what I've noticed. Um, and the big difference is that relational database all use the same query language. So, yeah, of course, there are some dialects in SQL, but the basic is all the same. Where for uh, property graphs, almost every database uses a different query language. So yeah, there's Cypher, there's PGSQL, we can go on. GraphQL, I'll come back to that later. Um, well, I have the most experience with uh, Neo4j, so I'll be uh, using Cypher for the demos I'm giving, because yeah, it's what I'm the most familiar with. Um, so yeah, let's run some queries. Uh, let's say that we created this movie database and I want to find all the actors who played in the matrix. Well, if it would be a SQL uh, database, then I could uh, use this query. So um, yeah, I have to need some, some, some inner joins and I need to have a where statement to find the movie. Well, in Cypher, um, it looks a bit like ASCII art basically. So I have a match statement where I say, okay, I want to find a node with a label person that has acted in 
a node with a move, uh, movie label with the property, the, the matrix. So if I would run that, and now I hope that the demo gods are uh, with me today. So this is a new for j desktop. It's a tool to um, well, query your database. Then if I run it, I can see, okay, so there are five people who acted in the matrix in my database. Um, as you can see, this is a query here, so I'm not cheating on you. Um, uh, if I want to find all the directors who also played in a movie, um, so yeah, of course, sometimes a director has a cameo in a movie. Uh, if I would do that with SQL, it would be a little bit harder. So I need an additional join statement. Uh, the where clause should be a bit different, and it's already getting a quite a big query. Well, in um, Cypher, I could just say, okay, I need an additional relationship. So I want to find the same node that we've queried before, but now it should also have a directed relationship with that movie, and it should be the same. So if we would run that, I can see that there are actually multiple um, of these pairs in my database. So for example, Clint Eastwood apparently uh, both directed and acted in um, Unforgiven. Okay, and uh, what if I find, want to find all the actors that played in uh, two or more movies together? Well, I am not a database expert, I'm not a SQL expert, but if I would want to write this kind of query, it would probably take me a day and a headache after that. Um, while in Cypher, it is actually pretty easy. So if we just look at the, the first statement, uh, we say, okay, we want to have the person who acted in the movie. Um, we have to find another person who also acted in that movie, then we have to do a little bit of a trick because um, we want, don't want to have duplicates because, for example, if we have uh, person A and person B, we will find that, we will also find B and A. So to make sure we don't have any duplicate results, we can uh, use the internal identifier of a node in Neo4j and basically say we only want, um, yeah, so ID that's uh, bigger than the other one. So in that case, we'll always get only one pair of the results. Then, with all the results that we get, we collect all the common movies in a list, and then we filter those results with a list that only have two or more results in them, and then we return that. So if we would run that, then we get actually get uh, a lot of results. And well, for example, we can see here that um, we have some Ben Miles and Rain both playing in Ninja Assassin and uh, Speed Racer. Well, I'm not sure if they're good movies, but at least we know that they play together in them. Uh, well, one more, uh, because I want to really demonstrate that graph databases are really good at traversing uh, relations, where relational database, though the name is relational, um, makes it pretty hard at, uh, now and then. So uh, is everyone um, familiar with the six degrees of separation? So it means that every person on Earth is connected with a maximum of six, six steps between them. Um, now, for example, I like the Matrix, so I want to tell Keanu Reeves, okay, I really like the movie you played in. So how can I do that? Well, luckily, the uh, database that we built uh, also has followers because yeah, everybody's leaving Twitter now since Elon Musk bought it. So we, of course, we want to be a social network as well. So we built that in. And that means that I can find the shortest path between me and Keanu Reeves. So I can write a query. Okay, give me a person with the name Jorrit van der Ven um, with at, uh, at most six follow relations between another node with a person named Keanu Reeves. So if we would run that, and we unfold that a bit, um, we can see there's only uh, three people between us. So maybe I can ask them to forward the message for me. Okay, so if you think, okay, this is really cool, I want to use it in my application, which of course you won't because that's the name of my talk, um, then it's good to know that there are official drivers for uh, basically all the JVM languages, all the .NET languages, um, for Node.js, Go and Python, and basically all the other languages in the world, there's um, yeah, a community driver available. So even Erlang has one, so then your favorite language must have one as well. 
Um, also, most uh, Java frameworks like Spring Boot or Quarkus or Micronaut have support uh, built in. So you just add a, a starter dependency to your POM or your Maven, uh, Gradle file, and you're good to go. Uh, if you're not using any major frameworks or Java EE, then you can use the object graph mapper that's available. So yeah, that's basically like your uh, object relational mapper, such as Hibernate, but then for graph databases. Um, and you're good to go. So I'm going to give just an example of how that would look like in your application. For .NET, it would look almost the same. Um, and if you've ever used uh, JPA, for example, then you will recognize that it's really similar. Now, instead of a table, we have a node. Um, the properties are annotated with a property instead of a column. And um, yeah, we can define relationships over there as well. Um, yeah, well, as I said, um, direct, uh, the, the relations are unidirectional, so you have to define which direction the relation is going. So in this case, I want to query the movies, and I want to know that all the relationships that acted in are coming into basically this type of node. Um, so if you want to run queries, then um, yeah, uh, Spring uh, Data Neo4j has repositories like Spring Data uh, JPA. So you can just create a repository, you get the default um, find by ID, find all uh, methods, and you can define queries. So if I put the shortest path algorithm in here, um, I can just run that. Um, if you're wondering what this strange uh, construction looks like, that's because uh, multi-string um, uh, statements in Kotlin or multi-row st uh, strings uh, use dollar signs uh, for string templating and Neo4j used that as well to inject the parameters to that. So uh, yeah, it looks kind of ugly. If there's anyone from JetBrains here in the room and you can fix it, please do. Um, so yeah, should I use a graph database? Um, well, that it really depends on the use case, of course, uh, the problem you want to solve. Um, so, if we can do a little quiz, um, if your problem is a search or selection problem, so for example, um, give me all the actors named Keanu Reeves, or find all the movies released in, on a certain year, or even find me the nearest supermarket, should you then use a graph database? Well, the obvious answer is no, because uh, you're not really interested in the relationships between the data. You're um, interested in one big table, basically, and filter on that. Well, relational databases are really good at filtering. So if, you, if this is your problem, please use a relational database. Um, of course, if you want to have uh, really complex searches, then you can also use a search engine like uh, Elasticsearch. Um, but just don't use a graph database for that. Um, if your problem is aggregation, so, um, OK, find me all the movies that were released in a certain year. or um, what were the highest grossing uh, movies in the last 10 years? Then again, yeah, the answer is no. Um, the, a uh, relational database is really good at filtering or aggregating. So, um, yeah, please don't use a graph database for that. Just use your old uh, relational database. It's just better. Now, this is a fun one. Um, I got a colleague who asked me, yeah, I, knew I want to use a graph database because I want to implement uh, an API with GraphQL. Is that a good idea? <laughs> so what do you guys think? Raise your hands if you think this is a good idea. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> really? Oh, I see a few hands over there. No, sorry, it's not a good idea. No. <laughs> um, GraphQL is a nice way to build uh, APIs, and especially if you want uh, to create an API, for example, for low bandwidth uh, applications or like mobile phones or apps, or you want just to do one query to get all the results you want. But of course, all developers know you should never basically send a query from your client or from your API directly to your database. And this is the same case. You can just use your regular database or don't use a database at all, but don't use this as a, re uh, as a reason to use a graph database. It will not be pretty. So if your problem is uh, related or recursive data, so, um, well, how do I and Kiana Reef know each other? Or, um, okay, I found this cool company here at HeapCon, and I want to get in contact with an executive to get me hired. Um, how can I contact that of a person? Well, then the answer is, yes, it's a good idea, because you're going to traverse relations. Um, so that's probably a good fit. 
Um, let's click this guy away. Um, also, it's pattern matching. So I'm not talking about uh, regular expressions here, but um, uh, let's say I have a huge database and I have a user called K Reeves and a user Keanu R. Are those the same users? Um, well, we can use a graph database because as we could see, we can really find patterns in these relationships. So if we can find the same patterns within these relationships, then we can basically say, okay, yeah, it looks like the same user. Um, same for uh, fraud detection. Fraud detection is actually one of the big use cases for uh, graph databases. If I get a transaction, I can find, did I find um, in my database other transactions that look the same? So should I allow this transaction or not? So yeah, basically I already given the answer, yes. Um, if you want to find patterns in your data, then it's a good idea to use a graph database. So yeah, as I said, I've um, been working with the graph databases for four years and um, I noticed a few things about them, so I would like to share my personal experiences with them. Um, first, yeah, I'm most experienced with Neo4j, so um, Neo4j has just great tooling. Um, unfortunately, they're not paying me, but um, well, their, their tooling is just really good. The Neo4j browser that I showed you before uh, is really uh, useful for testing out your queries. Uh, if you're a data scientist, they have a tool ca called Bloom, which is really interesting to um, explore your data and uh, to see what kind of relations you can find or um, basically uh, information that you didn't know was in your uh, uh, data set. Also, um, uh, at Rootscanner, uh, we, uh, our model grew and grew and grew, and we had to make several iterations of the model to keep the performance uh, on par. So if you're going to run a, a graph database in production and have a lot of queries on them, which um, are, uh, are intensive, then uh, yeah, probably your model is going to have a few iterations before it's really uh, up to standard. Um, and this has to do with um, the way you're querying your data, your, your data. At first, you're just exploring uh, if you can run the queries that you want to, and when you find out you can, you probably want to optimize the model to make it faster. Just for one example, if you want to ship a container, um, uh, there's a certain um, uh, order in the, uh, the kind of modality you want to use. So for example, you can use an ocean ship, and after that, most of the time, you want to use either a smaller ship or a train, and you don't want yet another ocean ship and yet another ocean ship. So those are the optimizations you want to put in your model. Um, yeah, because you, um, you really want to uh, be able to evolve your model, I don't recommend using a graph database as your main data source. You can use it as a read model, um, but make, always make sure that you have the data available somewhere else. So if you want to rebuild that model, you can, uh, you, yeah, you can do that because you still have the original data set. Um, if you're going to traverse the graph and uh, you want to be, uh, to be performant, make sure that you uh, reduce the number of starting points. So um, in the example that I gave before, from, um, with uh, find me the shortest path to Keanu Reeves, I really had to specify, okay, I want to find a node with the type person with the name Jorrit. Um, if I would just say, just give me any node with and maximum sex steps, then that would mean that it would start traversing all the relations of every node at first. So yeah, you can imagine if you're doing a depth first search, it's going to be really intensive. So if you can reduce the number of starting points, it will really increase the performance of your queries. Also keep transactions small. Um, we noticed that if we wanted to update the database and we thought, well, we can do that in a transaction because uh, then if the update is succeeded, then we have the new data set, and otherwise we just have the old one. And we tried to update like a million nodes. Uh, we just got out of memory errors on the, both the server and client side and everything would crash. Um, so yeah, if you're going to use transactions on the graph database, and especially in Neo4j, try to keep those transactions small to uh, prevent any uh, yeah, strange errors. Also, um, yeah, I saw, told you there's an uh, object graph mapper. Well, if, um, if you've used an object relational mapper, you probably noticed the infamous n plus one problem, which means that uh, you get a lot more data from your database than you intended to. Well, if you have data that's highly connected, you can imagine this is going to be an even worse problem sometimes. So uh, if you have highly connected data, which you have in a graph database, 
then I can really recommend um, um, only querying what you really, really need. And um, with the object graph mapper, you can specify the query depth. So you can say, okay, I want to have this type plus uh, one relation deep. Um, or you can, of course, write a query that really says, okay, I only want this type of node. So in our uh, Internet Movie Database example, if I would run a query uh, to get all the actors and I would query one level deep, then of course I would all get all the movies as well. So I'll probably fetch my entire database in one call. Not something you want. Um, so to summarize, never use a graph database when your data is disconnected. So if you just want to store uh, application logs, for example, um, then don't use a graph database. Um, However, I'll come back to this example later because there's actually some use case that you can use this. Um, if you just want to store data, data in tables. So for example, if you're writing a blog and you have blog posts and authors, yeah, then don't use a graph database, just use a regular database. Um, also, when you only look up data with known keys, so find user by ID, flow, find blog posts by name, something like that. Just use a regular database. Um, if storing data is way more important than retrieving it, also don't use a graph database. I told you uh, writing is pretty slow most of the time, so yeah, you can find an alternative that's probably better suited. Um, the, uh, if you want to store large chunks of data, that's something we found out to the hard way. Um, graph databases aren't that good at it, so if you want to store like blobs or big chunks of text, they actually recommend you to put uh, the data in a graph and then extract those ch chunks of, uh, or blobs, put them in the relational database or a key value store and first retrieve um, the identifiers and then get the, data, uh, the, the chunks from another database using those identifiers. Um, yeah, and I've already said, if your queries don't have a clear starting point, then also don't use a graph database because it will just be really slow. So uh, yeah, this is the except when you should part. Um, if your data is really highly relational, so if you have a relational database and you have a lot of uh, joint statements, then you might consider, okay, maybe there's a, a better solution for this, and a graph database might be uh, one of those solutions. Um, also, if you just want to know how your data is connected, so if you have uh, a data set, for example, of GPS points, and you want to know, okay, how are they related to each other, or to, um, for example, COVID contact tracing uh, was uh, a really good use case uh, for a graph database, I think in South Korea, they, uh, they use Neo4j for all their contact tracing in the country because you could see, okay, maybe um, if I have these people, um, have I seen other people in the area who might have, con uh, have contact with them? So, yeah, in that case, graph database is a good idea. Um, basically, if the, the information is in the relations and not in the data itself, then, okay, graph database should be considered. Um, yeah, about the log files, as you just said, um, if you don't just want to store your logs, but you, for example, if you have access logs and you want to see, okay, um, uh, what are the most visited pages or how do people come to these pages, then you could actually use a graph database because then you're interested not in the data points, but in how they are connected. This is an example that a colleague of mine used uh, a few weeks ago, so that's really cool. They gave me that feedback. So, um, so yeah, what are the common use cases for graph databases? Well, fraud detection engines, I already told those. Recommendation engines, so yeah, uh, the person who bought this also bought that. That's just a pattern matching, right? It's just, okay, given your user profile and given the product, you probably also want to buy this. Um, social networks, is yeah, they're just one big graph. I think um, uh, LinkedIn has one of the uh, 17 petabytes or something I heard. Um, uh, contact tracing, yeah, and of course, routing engines. Uh, that's where we use it for, and it was just a good fit. So, yeah, if you happen to build a routing engine, consider a graph database. Um, so, if you want to try it for yourself, um, the nice thing about uh, Neo4j, which I use most, is um, everything is almost everything is free when you want to start. So, um, if you just want to experiment, you can create uh, your own database in Neo4j or RDB. You can just create one for free, and if you want to scale it up, yeah, probably you have to pay, but. Um, Neo4j desktop is just a great development environment um, and you can get your free Neo4j certification and you even get a free t-shirt if you make it. So yeah, what's not more to like? Um, so that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that um, I've given you enough information to basically put a new tool into your toolbox. So if you happen to find a problem, 
um, which is a graph problem. You recognize it and you think, okay, maybe I should try this out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we still have like 30 seconds, let's say, if somebody has a question for Yard. Anybody? Uh, two questions, Riff. I told you you were popular. <laughs> Sorry, okay. for the mic so that the stream can hear you. <laughs> Otherwise, I can re uh, repeat the question. Yeah, that's fine. Hi. Uh, could you uh, somehow move relational to graph? In some point, you see, okay, yeah, this looks good, mm -hmm. but I do have a model and a product, etc. So what do I do? Should I move or start over? Or? Um, yeah, my advice would be to, sh to basically create a new model in for your graph database and not just copy the data because they're just completely different kinds of databases. So they probably uh, need a different approach to store that data. Um, as lead neo 4 j comes with an ETL tool, so it's easy to load data into there. And yeah, as, uh, as we did at our project, um, we just started with a model, tried it out, and figured out it wasn't a good fit. So we changed the model until it was a good fit. So it's probably not a first time right. But yeah, I guess that's okay. If you start with a new technology, that's not a problem. Is that a good enough answer for you? Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? We have one more if somebody wants to ask. No? Yeah. Okay. If you still happen to have any questions, you can just uh, drop by or yeah, I don't have any Twitter, so uh, you can send me uh, maybe a GitHub message or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short break, then return with the next track. Thank you.